He doesn't mind. Thank God you really offended him. Hey, it's Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. And I'm Laura. <laughs> I don't know why I always want to laugh at it. It's like I always feel like I need to explain for the listener that sometimes we don't tell people that we're going to do that intro and then there's just an awkward pause that I usually cut out where they're like, what am I supposed to do? And then they just instinctively, <laughs> that I one was smooth. That though. dance too that you just did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too bad no one can see that except you guys. <laughs> So, if I get another device in here, I can record our recording. Ooh. We got a third voice this week, Laura Goldfarb. Thank you for thanks for coming to hang out. And thanks, as always, to our backers on Patreon, who throw us as little as a buck an episode to lighten the load on this stuff. We got it dialed in now so that they can come hang out in our Slack team, which is we've basically given up on other social channels because, you know, they are what they are. <laughs> <laughs> but Slack has become a great just hub for, you know, when we run into interesting articles and stuff that don't make it into episodes, we just, we dump them somewhere in there and everybody can check them out. Do you mean our million the, followers on Twitter haven't been engaged? million followers. Oh yeah, I forgot about the part we're supposed to You guys to post like, a lot of stuff on NASA on your Twitter. As if. <laughs> you mean I'm going to tell you a secret a and I promise I won't cut this out. That's all automated. Oh. I have no idea what's going out. Right now. I think that's we why we're not getting any interaction. We were just like, this is 100% cool. Always. And it's public domain, so we're going out. <laughs> why don't you uh, Why don't you tweet out some of the the big questions that you ask? You know? uh, we're trying toward that with our <laughs> with some of the like the quote things that we're doing. Like wh when I'm editing, I aggregate things like that in the Slack channel. So if you're uh, on Slack and you're hanging out in the in the public channels, you'll see all that stuff. The piece I, where we bump to a strategy. Jesus, we're just starting the podcast. Okay, I know Laura. <laughs> Uh, we go, we go pretty far back, right? Like you, I think we met when your boyfriend at the time came in to do the like stupid yeah. live stream show that we used to do out of the back of my production office yeah. for like 200, 300 people to watch. <laughs> I remember that. What year was that? I was like, I was like, right? Like this is not, this is not when no, live no. streaming was a thing that people knew that, about. That was right? like 2010 or 2011. Yeah. So yeah. So you probably came in when it was a pretty well-refined show. Yeah. The I first few episodes of that up. were awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like me and my assistant sitting on chairs going, so uh, 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 <laughs> how did you making music? By the end, we were like, we need to get a background. We got to get a couch. Was this movies, music, and mayhem? Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, okay. I feel like that's a good intro to your background in, in PR and stuff, but I feel like I'll let you take it from there because we're not really here to talk about that. <laughs> no. Screw PR. <laughs> Um, yeah, my background of very often being the significant other of a musician, and then I learned better, and now I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're you had what did you, you studied? Oh gosh, like, in college. You, in college, yeah. In I college, like I that. studied. I first studied political communication because I wanted to be the president of the United States or press secretary. Um. And then I switched to public relations because I got too cynical about politics. Took one semester of public relations and thought it was a total BS. So then uh, switched over to advertising where I thought it would be fun to learn graphic design and to speak concisely and sort of uh, just, you know, cool stuff. <laughs> Uh, I got a degree in communication, though, in advertising, and a minor in psych. So, you know, that was pretty good. Whether we like it or not, because we don't want to lean on the credentialism of it, it's like, that's a chunk of your life you spent thinking about a thing that people don't, yeah. don't always spend a lot of time thinking about. How can I say this in a concise manner without losing the value behind the message that I'm trying to convey in 140 characters? <laughs> like, I, you know... <laughs> No, it's I think true. it's a collect. It's an exercise that, like, collectively people can actually understand now because they tweet. The mm -hmm. tweet is about as much space as yeah. you know a magazine ad headline, right? Right. That's a great um, point. 
But my view with college and all that, I mean, I, I do as, as often as possible mentor sessions with, with aspiring publicists and other folks within the music industry. And I kind of always just tell them, who gives a shit what you're studying in college? Just study something so you can speak and write well and build relationships with people and get a little bit of real world experience. Everything else, you know, who gives a shit? The fact that you do that mentoring stuff is why I was like, oh, she'll do the podcast. <laughs> like, we definitely have guests where we were like, ah, maybe, but I don't know. They might not want to talk about the stuff they do. I was like, oh, no, 100%. We just got one of the figure founding out the uh, <laughs> principles for his engineering was to kind of mentor each other mm. <laughs> and work through. Uh, I, I think some of our first like, 10, 15 attempts at creating episodes we could take public were really just us in like a shared therapy session. So we go, we'll use all the, all the mentoring. We, we have an episode, <laughs> an early episode called uncomfortable on uncomfortable conversations Ooh. that ended up mostly being about why people care so much about swearing, but it started from a discussion of our mission, which is like, why, why, why does that, why do I feel so uncomfortable? Like still we're recording right now. I know we're recording. I know it's going to go out over a podcast. I said, fuck earlier. And right before I said it, I was like, eh, just commit. <laughs> <My head. laughs> it's true though. I, I did just have that thought too. I, I paused before cursing because I was thinking of Brian's parents. <laughs> <laughs> They'll really appreciate well, that. And my dad <laughs> swears more than me. So. <laughs> No, but sort of the goal, I, I think uh, we established that that the goal is to have this be an episode that Brian's parents can listen to. You'll have to bleep the profanity for this one, Kurt. <laughs> my goal with regards to my therapy sessions with Brian is <laughs> to get him to accept Stop that his goal. parents will love him anyway. <laughs> it's true. Um, I hope. So I was I was running down some whole big like here's this weird deep broad way to talk about the PR universe that we both Lara and I both work in and Brian deals with from the engineering side. I run the digital side, the back end. Right. But you were like, yeah, but first I have a bone to pick. With. <laughs> and it was regarding a previous episode, so you know we got to talk about it. Yep. Because first people will have to listen to the previous episode. That's right. That's a good see, PR see, right that's there. exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Keep blinking. You're helping us already. That's really how I'm, how we're going to talk about PR. We're just going to kind of sneak it in there in little ways. <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to pick a, a well, a bit of a bone to maybe bring us to another topic, which is your episode with Scott Bauer, in which you really dig into pop music. And you make some really strong arguments that most of them I have to agree with. One of them I very much disagree with, which is your very sweet, kind, naive idea that the three of you could enter a room and write any one of those pop songs quite easily. <laughs> Ooh, I cringed when we said that. Yeah. <laughs> I, think... I was like, oh, I can't believe you just went there. And on I mean... the music PR side here, I'll dig into that just real briefly. Why? Because... It's not so easy to write a pop song. If it was so easy, we wouldn't have all of these struggling artists out there, both indie and major, trying to make it. You wouldn't have major label artists getting dropped that you've never even heard of because they didn't make that hit song. And, you know, it, there'd be even more shit out there. Like, I think that there's actually some really great music, even though it, I mean, you guys are right, even though it has the same chord progression it sounds exactly the same a lot of it is stolen <laughs> absolutely that that pisses me off but it is you know i think there's another side to it which is not everyone goes into writing a pop song with the intention of making a lot of money or becoming rich and famous and as i shared with you guys earlier during my meditation this morning i was thinking about this and i thought of my um, my dear friend Elaine Macaluso, who passed away in December of 2015. And Elaine was a songwriter, and she loved pop music so much. And Elaine was an older woman, and she had had a career of her own and earlier and decided that she really wanted to be a songwriter. So she moved to Los Angeles and chased after it. 
And Elaine didn't really give a shit about making money. She didn't give a shit about being popular or any of that stuff. It was about making music that was a place for her to express herself, a, a, a vulnerable, safe, sacred space to express herself, to feel good, and for other people to have that experience. And so every time that I was ever in a writing session with Elaine or overheard her in a writing session with someone, if she and those writers locked in a really sweet melody or lyric, she would make these orgasmic noises. <laughs> Just like, oh my God, oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you include that. And... um and it wasn't, you know, she wasn't making these orgasmic noises because the thought of making money. Most of her songs didn't really go that far and didn't make money. But it was because she had hit something that just felt good to express that and to release it. And so that's really the bone that I'm picking with you guys. It's that, you know, there's more to it than that. The side of what you were talking about is, is something that I'm, you know, super aware of because I'm married to someone who d does the same thing all the time. And so I know that it's not that easy and I know that it's, you know, it's like, but, but it's also just, it's funny to talk to somebody like Scott who is also involved in it the same way. Like they write songs together. So he's not, you know, he experiences the joy. And so when he sent out that playlist, I was just like, Oh, this is such a great way to demonstrate exactly what he is hearing mm -hmm. when he's so frustrated with it as a musician. Oh, but I... it unlocks that whole conversation about like, why, why, why you got to feel that way about it? Like I, I consistently defend pop music. I'm like, guys, it's not going to, you're not going to think about that song, but nostalgically ever again, it's not hurting your life. Just drop it if you don't like that this song is popular. <laughs> well, you know, okay. listen, I, I totally get all of the arguments are completely valid. And, you know, like I said, especially in a lot of the songs just being carbon copies of each other, it's bullshit. I get it, you know, but I guess the, the questions that I have around that are, you know, so what? So by just digging into that stuff, all that you're really doing is defending your right to be a curmudgeon about pop music <laughs> you know it's like okay we can do that you know we can allow ourselves those moments to feel that way but ultimately though why are we so quick to criticize something that does so much good because i mean sure you can argue the money side for the songwriters that's good but i'm talking about that human connection and that emotion the stuff that makes people at festivals, an entire field of people, jump up and down and their frequency and their energy is so high, you can just feel it as you walk in. You just feel that energy. That's some never good mind, stuff. Like, never mind the energy. It's called popular music. It's called <laughs> that because something is working and people like it. Like all of the stupid technology stuff that we talk about particularly the really advanced stuff all gets used on music first. Like everything we use for banking right now, everything we use for file sharing right now, the behavior, MySpace launched on the back of music, on the back of music, mm -hmm. like music. Although we want to look at like, you want to shit on the most popular of the music. We care about it enough that we broadly decided we were all just going to be criminals for like a five year period. <laughs> Everybody just stole their music. That's how it was. It lead, think, uh, it's, it's important to us, to us enough in life that, that it's, it's that and porn are the things to watch if you want to know how the future is going to be. <laughs> From a business perspective, you mean? From a business perspective. For research. From a media purpose. delivery perspective. Pop music right? and porn. Right. <laughs> That's a great pull quote. <laughs> PR. <laughs> I think the... Uh, a... a, a uh, popular music and and what you were just saying laura about the energy at a festival or the emotions or the joy or the connectedness that comes up with music is not really something that i think society has been very good at talking about right it touches on the space of like psychological and mental well-being which until very recently uh has been looked at as like disease, right? Oh, you're going to see a psychologist. Something must really be wrong with you. Um, and so 
it's really, I, we have a lot of these conversations around, like, I think all the stuff that you said you would agree with, a lot of it was like academic analysis that we've been brought up to do really well. Like, well, let's look at the musical structure and break it down. And it's just very repetitive, which is silly, right? Because no one buys an album because of the chord progression. <laughs> they buy but an album because it's what you study to go to school for that up. shit. <laughs> um, it's important, right? I mean, we have people who are uh, amazing musicians who can repeatedly produce pop songs, successful pop songs, um, but that's because they're so educated on it, right? They understand so many levels of music. Because I'm exposed to the personal musician side of it, it's like there's a part with any pop song where everybody's just sitting in the room going, yeah, it feels right. Like, it isn't like, they don't go, the quants say that the data analysis, blah, 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 what can go out the door, right? Like, in any creative endeavor, there's still this part where it's just like, there's this X Factor piece where it's like, oh, Justin likes it? It's going to be a hit. Like, put it out. He doesn't then have to explain why he likes it, like you would as a scientist. You know, it's like, it's distinctly a soft science in that regard. As is everything that's emotional or mental, I guess, right? How, how do you, how do you define the joy that music brings you it's it's and then why is it so important that it's a thing that we consistently like why do teenagers use it to classify one another in a way that's like you know like socially exclusionary and shit right like that's where the guilt about pop music comes from it's not because the gin blossoms are bad it's because the cool kids didn't like them when i was 15 (laughs) i still get ragged on for not being a nirvana fan (laughs) <laughs> like I actually like them now I've taken some time to get to know them but at the time I just wasn't exposed I'm so sorry <laughs> this is this this I think gets back to L- Laura and I didn't really talk probably for f- four years or so when I went off and did startup shit and then came back to LA we crossed paths again because one of the other people in my wife's band at the time had set up a meeting with some PR badass that he wanted us to talk to. <laughs> he was like, and you come. And then as soon as I got looped in on the email, it was like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, you just got trumped by this person that I've known longer than either of you, wife included. But then we talked about a lot of this same stuff because my philosophy of how you can do, how to do digital marketing, it, 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 it involves necessarily treading on and respecting the space that I was just talking about, right? This thing that has this power to push technology forward, to push conversation forward, to create such joy. Like that involves a connection with an artist and you're treading on that connection if you're going to try to use Twitter to sell things to people. And so it ends up being this awkward thing because uh, at the end of the rope, like what you're looking for, you got I got to make money. So they've got to sell some tickets but it doesn't have to feel like that because people want to come to the shows. And so you can build out this conduit in between those two people that isn't just, I'm going to hammer you with banner ads until you remember to buy a ticket, which is basically the model of advertising. Yeah. You know, a lot as of far that. back as social media was until social media was invented. So, well, I think of when I hear the term, uh, PR, um, I think of that as kind of the arm of marketing that actually deals with like emotional response because I, and, and it, because of that reason, it is a total, uh, black box to me. I mean, I'm an engineer by education, by trade, I program now. And so like everything is exacting. It's like make the numbers equal or else you're not doing your job. And it blows my mind. Is black box a technical a... term or is that colloquial enough that you can just leave it in there? <laughs> black box means that in your in your world, like in my head, software is something that you put a data set into and it spits out some other numbers and they won't tell you what processing happened in between. But those numbers are useful for you. I'm not sure we had to define uh-huh. black box, but <laughs> I feel like it's worthwhile. <laughs> Like, it's a really interesting idea that 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 robot that can beat world-class players, like the AI that can beat world-class players at Go, wrote its own code. Even the people that made that thing have no idea what's going on inside of it. It's a black box as much as your brain is to me. They're just like, ooh, it taught itself how to play Go. I mean, we could go parse the code, but we got no idea how that was written. 
Well, there's actually... <laughs> no, I'm scared. I don't want to chase this too deeply. There's actually no code, which makes it even weirder. There's 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 just like a deep decision tree that it that it dives into that you just could never chase. But along those lines, your black box, your mental black box, Laura, uh, your brain, your job, I'm curious how you take... Uh, how you build a mental model for PR, for marketing, for reaching people, reaching people emotionally. How do you build like a platform in your head for running that, to do that? How do you make decisions when it's so, when so much of what I feel like you deal with is this really abstract, emotional, mental response to things? Wow. That's an incredible question. I'm not even sure if I can answer it right now because I'd have to do a lot of soul searching to really, <laughs> um, you know, the, the way that I view PR is that it's kind of this necessary luxury. It really pisses me off because it's so much, so much of it is, I mean, the very essence of PR, it's the practice of shaping your public image and communicating directly with the media on a company's behalf, on an artist's behalf, whoever's behalf it might be. That's the gist of it. And the result of the work is publicity, which is news stories, um, interviews, and music. It's like song and video premieres, album reviews, um, television appearances, radio appearances, that kind of a thing. Um, but at the heart of it, you know, you're essentially for music PR. If you are an artist, it's hiring a publicist. You are putting yourself in this position that's saying, I want someone to critique my art. I want someone to, I want many people to critique my art. I want many people to validate my art. And there's always this feeling that I have with it where it's like, oh, that very idea just sounds so gross, you know? <laughs> um, and it's it's a big part of why I like to go to Burning Man, which we can talk about more later, um, because that's a space where no one is asking for a critique or judgment. They're just creating. Um, so it also goes back to the thing we were talking about before, of the freedom and safe space to express yourself. Um, but I digress. <laughs> I look at it as a necessary luxury item because for so many artists, in order to um, grow their fan base and, and sustain their careers with their art, they need publicity. So they need a publicist. They need PR support to help get them to the next levels that they want to go. They need it for visibility. They need it to build their portfolios, um, to get better shows, to get better guarantees at shows, um, to get invited to this, that, the other thing. Um, it all kind of, so it, it's, it's necessary, but it is a luxury item because not everyone can afford to have it. Not everyone can afford to do it. Um, so, you know, so much of what I do is working with independent artists. So that opportunity to really kind of create their public image and to really create how they're going to present themselves is kind of limited because there's limited resources. So it's really about taking what they have and figuring out what is their story? What is it that's going to help them to connect with the public? And maybe that's, they're really great at writing love songs and they're romantic. And so that's their story and that's their platform. Or maybe they're an activist and they're singing for singing and writing songs for people to stand up for themselves and to speak out. Um, or maybe they're just a fun dance party and they like to encourage people to have a good time and let loose, whatever it might be. So it's about finding that, that little piece. And it's about, it, it's that piece is about that human connection right? It's, it's that thing that is going to bring us together. Why, why we are here, why we want to be here, why, why we want to wake up every morning. What is their contribution to that? Part of how we crossed paths again was doing this, you know, I was doing a lot of like digital strategy work to back up your uh, PR efforts on things. And so we've had many conversations about this same kind of like, but if I had to take one lesson away from my first endeavor, the production company that I ran for I don't know, five and a half years or something, you still got a budget for brick and mortar at some point. Like you got to run ads somewhere. You got to, like there has to be a part of your 
conversation that goes out into the world and says to people, hey, look over here where there's all kinds of cool shit on these other platforms, blah, blah, blah. I was just talking to somebody at work about this the other day. Like, There is this space in there where if you can go out in the world and just like cheaply compared to if you're going to do like a TV commercial or something, you can go rent some space, set up a sculpture, and everyone will just talk about it on Twitter. Like, cause they just want to talk about cool shit. Right. So it's like, so there's now there's this weird thing of like, okay, if we want to maximize your money, there are ways to get out and do this stuff. But then that still adds that piece of like, it feels calculated. So it's this weird, like, and so this, I think gets to the transition in your experience, Laura, which is f- sort of from this PR space of like, okay, we're to put this image together. We got to here's how to package it. Here's how to present it. Here's the channels to follow. So the public can find out about you Mm -hmm. into community management, which I think is the difference is, I mean, do you want to tell a story of how that kind of came about? Sure. I mean, I'm still trying to figure it out to be honest. (laughs) Um, That's to me is the (laughs) digital. There's no roadmap, right? People are like, how do you do it? Literally I had an intern the other day that was just like, what do I need to know to get my head around this? And I was sort of just like, you need to know that every single message, every single community, every single, whatever you're attaching yourself to, to try to talk to these people about it. Mm -hmm. Like you you gotta, you, you first have to figure out, figure that piece out Mm -hmm. because you can't manage an inauthentic community. It just, the internet has bullshit detection built in. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> basically is yeah. what it comes down to. It's so. uh, you know, the, it's interesting to me in um, the idea of community doesn't really seem to be that present in the music industry. Um, we have this idea of, of, of fan bases and fans, but we never really look at it and treat it as a community. And the reason I say that is because I've been working in the music industry for about 11 years now. And my fiance is, um, he's a community consultant. He was VP of community at a tech startup, um, up until last fall. And now is, is now as a freelancer. And I had no idea what he did for work <laughs> for a good eight, nine months that we were together. Like I got it kind of, but not fully despite him trying to explain it to me. Um, and I think that that's really just a sign that it doesn't, it doesn't exist in the music industry. Um, it definitely exists in the tech world, but it does not exist in music. And so for me personally, in the last few months, really since end of January, beginning of February, um, it's something that I've started to able to assimilate it to the work that I do and see, see community in music. So the example that Adam is asking about, um, one of my PR clients um, from last year is an artist named Milk, and she released her song Quiet. It's like spelled funny though, right? What? The name. It's spelled like M-L. Oh, M-I-L-C-K. M-I-L-C-K. Yeah, that's not right, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got a C in there. Okay. You have to just, think about it. So, people are going to hit Google yeah, to know. I, or they're going to hit our show notes and they won't have to Google. I'm getting good at this. Am I LCK? <laughs> so I worked with Milk um, as a, um, she was an independent artist at the time. And we released her song Quiet right before, um, right before the Women's March, about a, maybe just a few days prior. And we went through the kind of typical indie PR channels and it did all right. Um, And then she went to Washington DC for the women's March and she had organized a group of 25 women, mostly all of them who she had never met before to uh, get together with her and flash mob this song at the women's March multiple times in DC. And it just so happened that one of those performances was filmed by a really fantastic music video and film director, um, Alma Harrell. And Alma posted this video of Milk and these women, uh, this acapella group singing the song Quiet. And within a matter of hours, it had 14, 15 million views on Facebook and Twitter, and it just kept going. And so 
basically from that point on, both of our lives changed very drastically. Um, very much so for her. I'm just sort of a, along for the ride. But my role with Milk, she's now signed with Atlantic Records and is preparing to release an EP pretty soon and a new version of the song as well and kind of go through that whole um, fantastic system. Uh, very supportive. But my role with her went from being an indie publicist to kind of an impromptu manager to help her figure out all these moving pieces um, to then handing over the PR reins to this badass team at Atlantic Records to then figuring out, okay, where do I fit into this? Um, she and I have a really great relationship and friendship and she was kind enough to ask me to stay on board in whatever capacity possible. And as we explored what was happening, we've realized that there was this community that had organically started to build. And we call it the I Can't Keep Quiet community. Throughout the Women's March, Milk had uh, signs that said, hashtag I Can't Keep Quiet. And that, as well as the song, went viral. And so there were these flash mobs that were starting to form all around the world, two in Sweden on either sides of the country, um, Australia, Ghana, everywhere in between, women and men coming together to sing this song, to support one another, to raise their voices. And these people wanted to connect with each other from all, all parts of the world. They wanted to have some sort of um, some sort of unifying feeling. And even just this hashtag and this one song was starting to do that for them. So now in the last few months, what we've done is um, essentially created this role for me, which is that of community manager. And what we've seen is that there is a, that it, the, the milk community are people that share this mission with her to speak up, to sing out, to create, um, to share their art on behalf of um, fellow gentle rebels. And they're more than just a fan base, and they should be treated as more than a fan base. And that has allowed me to see that within music, we're, we're kind of doing it wrong by looking at fans and a fan base as just people to like you on Facebook and to comment on your Instagram posts and to stream your song on Spotify and buy albums. It's more than that. You know, these are people that you have the opportunity to connect with and to develop long-term relationships and genuine experiences with. And if you don't do that, I think that's where I think that's where we're going wrong. I think that's where you miss the mark. And that's where you're not creating a long, a long-standing career. The way I've always gotten into talking about that frequently with artists themselves is you just you if it was just about the music, right, the sound coming from wherever it comes from, it hitting you in the ear, then there would be no business for live shows. Mm. And in fact, as, a, as an artist these days, you make most of your money from live shows once you hit the point that you can put butts in seats in any town that you go to. There's got to be something else there than just the music if people give a shit enough to get off their asses, drive a place, frequently at great convenience deal with a whole bunch of other people, an expensive beer, <laughs> <laughs> well, listen to you play your music for them, right? Like it's this personal, there's some energy in that room that is not, you know, accounted for in the equation that our capitalist system presently supports. It's interesting you say <laughs> that though, because for a lot of artists, touring actually isn't even an option or touring doesn't actually give them that much money. Um, That's why I say when they hit that bar, right? Like there's yeah, a point. Well, but so it another does. another it's avenue higher. would be for a lot of artists actually their their re their main source of revenue is in placements film and television placements hmm. right. and so that is interesting to me because usually you don't know who the artist is especially if it's an, an independent artist whose song is in a film or a TV show and so right there you're looking at that um, that emotional connection. You know, there's music, there's something there that's drawing you, that's pulling you in, that's connecting you. And so it's that thing that is allowing 
so many of these artists to become successful. So if we focus instead on just a song and a video and all the stuff that you're trying to sell, and you focus on the connection that you have with other people, the connection with your community, I think that's the space in which to really explore. What's interesting about that, like the fact of placements for me is from the side of somebody who studied film a whole bunch, there's a phenomenon called Mickey Mousing, which is when you overuse the score to add emotion. They call it Mickey Mousing because early animation was shitty. And so they would always have scores on top of it that was like, boom, 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 to pace the scene because the animation was very limited by what could be done. Grey's Anatomy, Mickey Mouse is the shit out of every episode with really good, like, but if once you know to look for it, you realize that almost every closing montage in Grey's Anatomy gets its emotional force from the song and not from what's happening. Because it's usually just shots of doctors running through a hallway or some shit. <laughs> so but there's true. this like, but there's a pop song over it and motherfuckers are crying. So it's like, <laughs> the, it's back to that same like energy difference where it's like people, you know, they, they shit on it and they don't, you know, take it seriously. But that same, like, what you're talking about with community is taking the same force and saying, here's this thing we all care about that, you know, pop music was the catalyst to like facilitate this communal experience. Um, and it's real weird when you're in advertising because people are like, and we want to build a community. I can, I can help you with that, but I really can't make any promises because there's a certain degree of like authenticity that if we don't nail perfectly, everybody goes, nah, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Community. Not is not, in. It's not a, it's not a numbers thing. You know, it's, um, you know, it's the, in music, there's that idea that, you know, if you have a hundred fans who, um, spend a hundred dollars a year, what is it? A hundred fans, a thousand fans and spend a hundred dollars a year. You're doing pretty well. Um, we classify fans as a B and C level fans and a being the ones that are going to spend the most money and C that are kind of hit or miss. Um, but I, community is not, again, it's just, it's not the, the amount of followers that you have on social media. I mean, sure it is that, but that doesn't go very far. You can't really, it's quantifiable, but it's, but it's also not, I mean, you can't chase that. Like one of the things that one of the slides that I include in all of my decks is you can't, you can't chase virality. You can try to set up the best environment to leverage it. And you can try the best to nail down the authenticity of the, of the thing that you're trying to support but you can't, and then you can consistently stay on that message with, you know, up on these platforms that are super apt to result in communities forming, mm -hmm. but I can't make you any promises and corporate overlords really don't like that as an answer, <laughs> but that's, that's the low, like that's the, the cross to bear for any digital department. So it's like, it's this really interesting space where there, there has to be that, like, it goes back to the thing I was saying about the, there has to be that brick and mortar component, right? Like you, Milk had to go out into the world and do this thing yes, or else just none of it can possibly happen. Absolutely. And so you can stack the deck by running a Super Bowl commercial, but that's really expensive. And it's a Super Bowl commercial. So you have built in some bullshit that the internet might go, eh, nah. <laughs> That touches on, I think, part of my own, uh, <laughs> sort of judgment of marketing and pop culture that I, I try to avoid, but um, the idea of like seeing someone who's already popular and then they produce the same song, same sound, same chord progression, whatever. And you're like, ah, it's popular because they already had everything. They already had a fan base, um, which can, can feel frustrating. And in the world where you're constantly comparing yourself to everyone else all day long <laughs> with the internet now, you're like, well, I can never be that because I don't have that. I don't have the fan base, fan base already. Um, that was kind of just a comment to what we were saying. But the real real thing I was waiting to say there is I'm, I'm really curious and interested in your experience, Laura, with having a PR around an artist and a song that uh, evolved uh, 
I guess it sounds like sort of organically or not that you guys necessarily plan this, but evolved into being part of something else that also is a, a product and something to package and promote. Um, and so you've now got like a, you've right. Got 10 million people that's... don't show up without you telling 10 million people right. to show up. It doesn't just, they don't well, just go, Hey, I had an idea this morning. Well, you had this this song. That I, I, listened, and make I listened to it yesterday. It's a beautiful song. It's like it's really impactful and powerful. And the video especially draws in a lot of the features of the emotional response. But then you also now have it tied to a movement and uh, something that's a social good as opposed to a product. I very cynically, when Adam and I were talking about this beforehand, I was like, I want to ask her about how it feels to be promoting uh, social change for half of the humans on earth um as opposed to selling like sugar water like a coke campaign being tied to a Katy perry song yeah um Oof. so to to rewind a bit um for milk and i'll do my best to to present her correctly accurately and well um but that's not really your job anymore <laughs> yeah i know right so it's not like it was before <laughs> <laughs> uh, pr note um so you know kind of Ta going back to what we were talking about with the intentions behind writing pop songs, you know, Quiet is a pop song. It's a different kind of pop song, but it's still a pop song. Um, Milk wrote it as it was, it was her thesis. It was her talking about her own abuse, her being a survivor, and finally having the courage to speak up and to speak out. And it was such a therapeutic process for her. So it wasn't about, I'm going to write this song and it's going to be a hit. In fact, she had spent so much of her career already trying to do that, trying to do that thing. As with plenty of, uh, plenty of clients of mine try to do that. And then they get to this point of realizing, well, that's just not working. And it's kind of bullshit too. And it doesn't feel good. So they stop doing it. And then they start making the real great, heartful or heartfelt stuff and then sometimes that becomes really popular and that's awesome for them but with quiet it was it was that very thing where it, it was a personal thesis it was her statement for herself it was her therapy song and it actually wasn't even written about or for the women's march it wasn't even it was written years before um the the election so it wasn't even in response to trump being elected um she just felt that when that happened, that this was the time to release it. This was her plot. This was, this was her space that just all, everything just felt aligned. And so she'll tell you, she never intended to be an activist. She never intended for this to be what is called the unofficial anthem of the women's march. <laughs> that was not, that was not the game plan. But once it pops up, it's your job to roll with it. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember it was, um, it was it's like your civic duty. I feel yeah. like in this case, right? Like what, well, what? <laughs> so that, you know, and you guys would have no, to I chat with her to, to get her specific take on it. But, you know, I can tell you that, you know, a month, two months after the women's March, when the song was clearly viral and it was creating this this thing on its own in this community, this I Can't Keep Quiet community had developed, we got a call from a freelancer who was writing an article for Vanity Fair on protest songs against Trump. And I remember having a, a phone call. I was at a, at a show at Hotel Cafe in Los Angeles and it was 10.30 at night Milk had been doing interviews all day, running around in Manhattan, taking label interviews. And I'm on the phone with, with her and, and her then manager. And we're trying to figure this out because she does, she's not a supporter of Trump at all. Um, but her message has always been one of positivity, not one of protest or resistance. She doesn't, she doesn't like that negative feel. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said and she's a very spiritual person and there's a lot to be said for this idea that if you are putting out, whatever you're putting out there into the universe, that's what's coming back. So if you're putting out these ideas of um, protest and resistance and hate and all of that, then that's what's going to come back. So the idea is instead, let's put out these feelings, these positive feelings of love and support and encouragement and the safe, sacred space. So the idea of being included in an article about protest songs against Trump, she thought, well, 
this wasn't written, this wasn't written as a protest song. This isn't about Trump. This is my song. This is my story. And I hope that it helps other people. So what do we do with that? Because when Vanity Fair is asking you as an independent artist, can we feature you? You know, that's a tough one to turn down. Um, so again, you know, here's where the PR stuff comes into play. So I had a conversation with the writer and and explained it with her and was just really transparent and said, you know, Milk, she didn't sign up for this, but she's stepping into this role, but it's still a new role and she doesn't want to exclude anyone. So, you know, is there a happy medium? Can we figure this out? And the writer totally understood it. And most writers, you know, I, I give so much credit to their professionalism and their skill and their talent especially when you give them the opportunity to actually create the story that they want to create. And this writer did, and it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. It's just unfortunate that it has that headline, um, you know, but Vanity Fair is, has their relationship with Trump. And so that's what the headline is. But so, yeah, she's, she's become this activist um, and it's a role that she is, that she's in. And, and it, from what I see kind of stepping back and looking at her, in the last, I've known her for eight years, seven, eight years now, and we've only been working together for a short period of that time, but it is a role that she has stepped in and she is, she's owning it. And I think ultimately, you know, a big part of the work that I'm doing with her is to have a grounding force to make sure that that grounding connection to the people and the public is there. Cause that's what started this. That's why the song went viral. So she wants to always make sure that as everything is happening with the major label and her artist career is taking off that she doesn't lose sight of that. So there's always a connection back to it. So which relates to my hazy version <laughs> of like, if people say when you have jobs, like community, like you said, like you didn't even know what your significant other really did for that, you know, period of time. It's like as a producer, then as a strategist, you get a lot of what exactly do you do? <laughs> as a digital strategist, right? Like, what's your job? And yeah, there's 17 hats if you work at a small company or, or independent. But like, at the core, I tend to feel like I'm the keeper of like what you just described, of that connection via these way more visceral forms of media delivery than than all the other ones, right? So, I mean, video is super visceral, but it's also super controlled. It's super, as social media is just, you have to find this core thing that you can rest the central interest of everyone who might be into the thing that you care about, and then just be really careful to, to honor it, even if you don't understand it. I'll be back in one, one minute. Pardon me. <laughs> I think I was going to say that probably will end up getting cut, but that ties us back to the, the other episode. You talk about the struggle and the kind of like, there are people that make it look easy, right? Like when the record company tells Tom Petty he needs to go write a hit song, he goes, God damn it, I hate you. And he gets all angry. And then he goes and he writes a hit song, <laughs> like iconic songs, you know? Yeah. So it's like, when you hear that story, you're like, man, I could sit in a room and smoke half a joint like Tom Petty just did and write some shit that's better than this. It's like, no, you can't because he's a freak, which ties back to another thing we talk about a bunch on the podcast, which is like aspiring to be a certain caliber of athlete mm. is just not a healthy thing at some point, right? Like I, I grew up training with Michael Phelps. His physical proportions, he is perfectly built for his sport. To that though, th so this is one of the things that always fascinates me, this topic um, that I think we just don't talk about enough within the music industry, which is that the music industry is not that much different from any other career path or industry in that it is a career path. And there can only be so many people that are at the very top you can only have so many surgeons or head of surgery. You can only have so many Michael Phelps. You know, you can only have so many of whatever that's filling up the top. Everything else has to create that pyramid. That's just kind of how it works. That's how most industries run. So this idea that so many artists have of, of trying so hard and killing themselves over this idea of working their way up to the top, when if they just stopped for a moment and looked that they actually – have it pretty good where they are and they could be even bigger and more successful and do better in the spot that they're in. But it's just, we forget about that sometimes. 
Well, I think it's because until like about the time that we were in college, you kind of couldn't. Like, I mean, you couldn't make, a, you couldn't do it as a career option, you know, maintain a low level fan base. It was just, there was too many letters to send, literally. <laughs> like, so, so, you know, the exciting thing about digital technology that I think brings it back to the stuff that I, we certainly feel more comfortable talking about. <laughs> um, it, like it it's a new thing to be able to have a world of art that treads on this thing at such a great volume, right? There's always been patronage. There's always been ways to do it. I, I really liked your comment earlier, Laura, about um, it's kind of in your attitude during the whole conversation, but uh, your community uh, is not defined by its size. I, I don't know if you said it, you didn't say it exactly like that, but uh, and you you can have a community of just a few people and the impact you're having on those people is can be just as profound as maybe a bigger artist's impact on that they have on hundreds of people uh and and if you that perspective like really really hit me when you said it like it you hear if you just look up like online how to how to promote your podcast for instance it's like it's all about community it's all about connecting with those early users early adopters early listeners whatever you want to call them uh but that conceptually it's so hard it's one of those things that's kind of esoteric from a a growth perspective or like an analytic engineering perspective on something and you're like well what do i do with them there are only 3 of them <laughs> i need 3 million of them um but the if you're looking at what you're doing from the perspective of giving value or having an emotional connection or doing doing good or you're even yourself enjoying it uh you can like really capitalize on those three people <laughs> um, you know you you asked before at least i think you did um something about the experience of of promoting good stuff, do good, feel good <laughs> stuff versus, you know, just music. I think like ultimately, yeah, it's, it is a lot easier to promote stuff that has some sort of a philanthropic side to it, some sort of a social side to it, other than just a product, be it music or something other that you're trying to sell. Because again, that's what binds us together. You know, it's that that human connection. So it's a lot easier. I think when you're looking to build that community, you can open your door and step outside and start asking who's interested in this, who cares about this, who wants to change the world with this. Um, you're more likely to get some response and start dialogue than just who's looking for some awesome new music. You know, it's, there are those people, but it is a little bit more challenging to, to start a dialogue with them about it. But it's also strategically way more fluid. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with this brand? Man, I got to think about it for a few weeks. I got to talk to a bunch of people. I might come back and tell you it's not doable. <laughs> like, right. Uh, I, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's not going to be a like a rabid Viagra community on Twitter. I'm sorry. That's just <laughs> reality for that product. Um, anyway, thank you to, to uh, Lara for... Hanging out, talk about all this stuff. Yeah, this has been a really awesome conversation. Was, Thanks for taking time great. out of your Saturday morning to hang out. Thanks, guys. It's It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for helping to open my mind a little bit, too, about stuff that's going on and ask those deeper questions. We try. As uncomfortable as they can. <laughs> this is the perfect place to get out of here and say that we'll keep talking about this stuff. But if you want to engage in the community, we have a Slack channel where we talk to people. If you tweet at us or whatever, we'll we'll add you in there. The other way to get in is by throwing us as little as a buck an episode on Patreon, which just helps us lighten a load on like the server space it takes to host files and things like that. Um, check that out at patreon.zengineeringpodcast.com. P A T R E O N. <clears throat> Okay, back to sounding like I don't know what I'm doing. This is Engineering Podcast. I'm Adam. I'm Brian. And I'm Laura. Enjoy everything you listen to today. And don't forget to dance.
but you're also you're also genuinely uncomfortable underneath i think if you're being honest right oh yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm pretty much uncomfortable at all times <laughs>